All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of Catching Up with Jacob from a non-disclosed location. Jacob Prash, how are you? I'm here in Jesus. How are you, more importantly? Praise the Lord. We are well, by the grace of God. Thank you for joining us, Jacob. It's late in England, but we're going to keep you up a little bit longer today, right? I'm not in so, England, but some of our watches are. <laughs> uh, David Lister, how are you? You're in the South. I'm in the free state of Tennessee. Glad to be here. Praise God. Jay, not in California. Yeah, on the I'm outside, in. I'm by, you know, near Mexico, I suppose, somewhere around there. Uh, yes. How are you today? Jay, I am still in the state of Texas, uh, still somewhat free, although I'm sure they're going to try to turn this place into another California, like they try to rubber stamp every state into California. Well, you are in Houston, so yeah, I, I think that is true. I think that is true. Uh, Davey, from down under, down in Saturday, it's Saturday morning already there. So, Davey, how are you? Yeah, <laughs> can't believe it's Saturday already. But yeah, good to be with you guys. Thanks for being with us. God bless you. And uh, just wanted to make sure we join, we uh, uh, welcome all those who are watching now, those who are watching later, uh, to Catching Up with Jacob, episode 201, 201. And so marks a new a new milestone after our two hundredth episode, and uh, we're getting really close to the end of the year now. We got three months, so we welcome you in the name of the Lord. And as we go over all these events and what's going on from a biblical perspective, we welcome you. And we're going to have questions for Jacob at, after the episode. We have a a special time called backstage, and you won't be able to find us on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, we will be leaving those platforms to go on. The other ones, which you can catch us on Rumble, you can catch us on Telegram, you can catch us on Vimeo, you can catch us on Morial TV, MorialTV.org, you can catch us on more and more Rumble uh, because of the questions that come in. We You can ask questions on Rumble. So if, if you want to ask Jacob some questions and we'll read it in the on the air, we will be able to do it on Rumble. So go into the Rumble channel and be able to find us there. And yes. you would ask the questions. So uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So great stuff. Jacob Prash, you got any announcements? Yes. Well, first of all, we always urge our viewers to watch us on an independent platform. One of our own servers, moriel.tv um, or morieltv.org. Watch us on Rumble. Watch us on RTN. Watch us on anything. But we want to place ourselves outside of the domain and control of the powers that be to the extent possible in the interest of free speech. Secondly, Marco will be joining me in England and in um, Scotland for two conferences together with Pastor Tim Leach. First of all, though, on the 24th of October, I will be speaking at Newton Abbey at Calgary Pentecostal Church with Pastor Stephen Trimble, 7 p.m., at, in Newton Abbey at Calgary Pentecostal Church, the evening of, of the 24th. The 25th, 26th, 27th, I will be with Pastor Marty Foster. The 25th, we have a men's meeting in Bangor. The 26th and 27th of October, we will be at Orange Field Crescent at Agape Christian Fellowship, as usual, in Belfast. On the 28th, I will be in the Republic of Ireland, County Donegal, in Valley Buffet, at Jackson's Hotel, Morial meeting at Jackson's, familiar turf to us, um, on the 28th at 7 p.m. Yeah, it's all right. Hall, Republic of Ireland. Catching up. Uh, Marco then will be joining me the first weekend in November with okay. Pastor Tim Leach in oh, Scotland. Right. Now, the Scottish Prophecy Conference will be entirely different than the English Prophecy Conference. The Scottish Prophecy Conference, I will be... Pre reviewing the uh, outline of the next book, Born in a Major, Coming on a Cloud. Um, that'll be a major session. We're also going to do something different in format. Q&As or question and answer times are often restricted to um, only what's discussed at the conference in the presentations or the teachings. And some of the questions can be prohibitively long because they require so much background development to answer the question in context. 
for people who may not be familiar with the background. Therefore, we're going to have an extended Q&A session that'll be interactive. We've never done this before, but we know people come with a lot of questions related to the close of the age and the return of Christ. So we'll first take questions related to the event, and then other questions from any of my books, any teachings of Marco, any teachings of mine, any teachings of, of, of Tim Leach concerning the return of Christ. That'll be the Scottish conference. It'll be one kind of conference. The English conference held in Yarnfield the second weekend of November. That will be um, a different kind of conference called Prophecy and Velocity. And we're looking at the pace of change of the things that are happening, uh, how prophecy is gaining momentum. Um, again, we never speculate about dates for the return of Christ, but there are things happening at such a pace now that it, it, it's become frantic. For instance, 30 years ago, or I'm sorry, not 30, in 2001, 2001, um, 23 years ago, I said that handheld iPhone technology was going to be such that fallen man would think he can reverse the Tower of Babel. Well, that is happening now, only it's not simply you put something in in English and somebody answers in Japanese. You speak into it, and then they speak back to you in English. Um, again, God put a limit on human language. Man with his technology thinks he can reverse the limits that God has placed on things like language, longevity, and of course the entire uh, coming, basically revamping of, 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 of communications as we know it by artificial intelligence. We're going to be looking at these issues and their implication in light of biblical prophecy. So both conferences will have the same speakers, both conferences will deal with prophecy, but two entirely different aspects. Two entirely different aspects. England will be prophecy and velocity. Scotland will be a prophecy conference that we want it to be interactive. We want people to bring the topics as much as the topics we're going to present. So if you can join us, join us. The details are found on Morio website, morio.org on the itinerary page, or you can simply Google Moriel Itinerary or web search Moriel Itinerary. Marg is taking the bookings for Scotland, and Beryl is taking the bookings for England. Marco, again, will be joining me, as well as Pastor Tim Leach. After Looking that, forward to it. Yeah, after that, Tim will be coming to the United States as well. Marco. Looking forward to that. Thank you, brother. Looking forward to that, both in Scotland and England, so Staffordshire. So uh, we'll get ready to go. It'll be a lot of fun to be there. And uh, it, it is interesting. I was reading about the, uh, the 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 Scotland revival that happened some time ago uh, under Mr. Campbell, Duncan Campbell, and uh, yes, it's in the island of Lewis, on the island of Lewis. So interesting. We'll be close by. Uh, but how far has it come, Jacob? Is Scotland? I mean, it's not that long ago. We're not talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago that this happened, but how far has Scotland gone from the Word of God? The Hebrides still have a residual Christian influence from the revivals of the late 1940s. But apart from the Hebrides, Scotland is pretty much post-Christian neo-pagan, even more so than England. It's, no. it's, it's, it's a godless country. The Presbyterian Church is, is apostate nearly all of it. The Church of Scotland is, if it was apostate, that would be an improvement. Um, Scotland is finished, as, as it stands right now. There are just pockets of faithful believers in Scotland, but outside of the Hebrides, um, you will not find many saved Christians. Very good. Thank you so much. Well, hopefully by being there and preaching God's Word and praying and we want everybody to pray for Scotland and England as well. Uh, yes. we, can make a, we can make a dent into that uh, apostasy that's going on there. So is America. So is Canada. So is many yes. places, really the English-speaking nation. So thank you, Jacob. And uh, we want to welcome those who are watching live. 
because we also want to let you know that podcasts are also available and you can find us on Spotify, find us on iTunes. You can find us in quite a bit of platforms. You can find Davis teaching, Jacob's teaching, Sandy's teaching, uh, as well as some of my teaching there as well on the podcast. Morial podcast is a great way to share uh, quick audios, quick uh, way to give information out. And um, so if you're going for a run, you're going for uh, long traveling in your car, you can put one of these podcasts on audio and uh, get some really good biblical teaching. So uh, very good. Let's get started with some of these um, some of these difficult topics. Jacob, we got we got a lot of stuff here, so we'll, we'll go through them as quickly as we can. We want to get to the church issues uh, in which we want to spend some time on that. But I did want to ask you, here in America, we got less than 45 days before the election, 45 days before the election, less than that. And People are ramping up to what many consider an October surprise, which has happened many times in the election cycle. Uh, Kamala's radical. Iran is looking to kill Trump. 25% of Democrats says, I wish the, the two assassination attempts would have happened. It is a mess. Biden's on the view. What do we expect from an election cycle that is just looking like more and more like a crazy cycle? Polarizing, civil war. Jacob Press, give us your take on it. Something I've quoted before. Desperate people do desperate things. The mainstream media, the globalist establishment, the Democratic Party establishment. I was watching an interview with Robert F. Kennedy, RFK Jr., only today, although it was recorded some days ago. He described how the Democratic Party is anti-democracy, mm. how their motif, how their modus operandi is completely anti-democratic. Um, <laughs> Anti-free speech. Um, basically, they they told CNN, if you include Robert Kennedy in the debates, we're not going to host the debates. I, they, they made that a condition. They are crazy. Yeah, democratic. Now, yeah, Kennedy, a Kennedy with the New Democrats. I know. Understand something. They're quite happy to use stooges. Quite happy to use stooges. But if the stooge begins to realize they're a stooge, there's a problem. This has already happened with Alan Dershowitz. He was, they were quite happy when he was a liberal Democrat supported Hillary Clinton. Now that he's begun to be, to be confronted with realities he cannot ignore, even in his senior years, he is changing his tune. They mm. turn against him. Wow. The Kennedy family, iconic. Yeah. Iconic. Emblematic. <laughs> Of the Democratic Party, <laughs> historically, they turned against him. Eric Adams, I'm no fan of Eric Adams. As soon as he spoke out against Biden's policies, what happens? They turn against him. As we've always said, they don't care about blacks, homosexuals, women. They just use those people as stooges to manipulate them. But when one of them, one of them breaks ranks, and sees the writing on the wall and realizes what's really happening, the way Dershowitz did, or Robert Kennedy did, or Eric Adams did, they will come after them like a herd of bad hyenas with rabies. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, if you're ah! black, if you're Hispanic, or if you're an Irish Catholic. It doesn't they matter. Tell. Yeah, It's not about that. They'll play those cards to manipulate naive and stupid people. But they don't care about those people. They're just, they're stooges. Yeah, or as Stalin called them useful idiots. Yes, that's right. You know, if, if you're a woman who votes Democratic, you to them are a useful idiot. If you're a black person who votes for Harris, to them you are a useful idiot. If you're a left-wing Jew who votes Democrat, you are a useful idiot. That's all you are as a useful idiot. But they are frantic that some blacks, many Hispari Hispanics, and increasing numbers of Jews and women in the in in, in the swing states. Some yeah. are waking up enough to make an electoral difference, and they are freaking out. Yeah. We've already seen the corruption of the deep state. This time, not with the only with the FBI or CIA, but with the Secret Service. We've seen the corruption and the, the deliberate deliberate lack of president of, of, of security for a presidential candidate. Biden did not want to protect Kennedy with, with Secret Service agents, even though his father and his his uncle were both assassinated famously <laughs> while running for president. The Biden administration 
denied Secret Service protection to Robert Kennedy initially. We saw the whole scandal at Butler and then again at Mar-a-Lago. We see that they want him knocked off. They want him knocked off. I'm not saying they would pull the trigger themselves. I'm not saying they wouldn't. But I'm saying that they want him knocked off. Anything can happen. Anything. Mm. Anything. We need to pray. Amen. Amen. And David Lister, October surprises are not really that unusual. We've had them from the, since the 1800s, happened in the 1900s, yeah. happened in the election cycle. Uh, what do you expect for this election cycle? What October, I mean, we're ramping up and we're, we're about to hit a point of inflection, in my opinion, in terms of something's got to give. But when you have 25% of Democrats who are saying, according to the Rasmussen, uh, Rasmussen poll, that they would rather have the assassination been successful rather than the, the, the it failed. Uh, you, we're in big trouble here. Yeah, I mean, most people haven't heard about the octo octopus October surprise under Reagan, which uh, basically one of his minions was working behind the scenes with Iran to get the hostages released. That's right. And screw over, uh, and screw over Jimmy Carter. So, you know, they and when you look into that, it's CIA, deep state, assassinations, everything else goes on, you know. So when they want to bring something to bear, they will bring it to bear. And like Jacob said, they do not want Trump. But it is, I, God forbid, I mean, the power of prayer and God's protecting twice. They caught the third one. No one talks about the Pakistani man with all the half a million dollars, I believe, and wanting to really? offer a reward yeah. for a hitman. Got caught, yeah. landed. So uh, I don't know where the 500000 is. It's, you know, maybe Serena among the guys that uh, had to go in. But it's it's something that they do to try to change at the last minute the election outcome. Right now, Democrats are freaking out behind the scenes. They're talking like nobody's believing her now. They they mm -hmm. don't understand what she's talking about. They're they she's not making her case for her economic policies. Uh, she's you see if you even when you watch MSNBC, you're seeing some of their commentators come out against her on economic policies. You're seeing on uh, uh, Bloomberg even them have, to have some of them selectively have come out against them. Uh, and even on CNN, people have openly spoke out against her on economic issues that her policies are just insanity. And that, you know, if they don't get the Senate and the House, she was asked the other day, how's she going to get all this money? And she just explained, we just got to get it. We just got to get it. So, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's out of her league. And the only way to really possibly get her in is an October surprise, mm. something that would change the outcome dramatically. And though that's if you go back and read about October surprises, you might see. And the octopus one is the most famous one that I remember. Yeah, that, that is a radical one. Also, the federal government collaborated with Zuckerberg and certain other people and the mainstream media, of course, yeah. to suppress the content of Hunter Biden's laptop. Huge. And the way and they now, lied. Because and now he's been... coming back over for Trump now. He's in talks with him. So they're worried. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jay, I wanted to ask you a question. What if the October surprise is an assassination attempt that is successful? I... I uh believe that if the October surprise was a successful assassination attempt on Donald Trump, that we would see a very interesting ticket. We would see J.D. Vance as the vice president, and I'm going to say we'll probably see Kennedy as the main person to step up and take the ticket. And in that case, the Democrats have gone from bad to worse. They will lose that. Nah, yeah, that that would be that would, would be, be radical. Be, I, it would be a sympathy vote for Vance, 
And if you took Kennedy as a VP, as a political move, I, I agree with James. It would be very difficult for Harris to do anything to, to overcome that kind of a formidable electoral adversary. The the other question that I had, it's I was reading about the U.S. lawmakers. So this is Congress uh, preparing for a mass casualty event. This, this was bizarre because the implications are startling. This is what they want. They're taking drastic steps to even even put a amendment in the Constitution that would allow them to appoint replacements for vacancies over a mass casualty event in the House of Representatives. So you can have, let's say, a hundred uh, vacant seats, and you can just appoint them. Now, obviously, there's a lot of complications in terms of what the amendment would be, and it has to be passed. But what did they fear and why are they preparing? I mean, the implications are chilling. If you can think about the the, the point of inflection that we're, we're about to hit. Uh, Jacob, what are your thoughts? What, what do they fear? Is it, it's just nothing, something, or they're tipping off that they're concerned about the fact that nobody believes in government anymore, and they're not going to accept anything that they offer? Again, it's about power. And they would push a doomsday scenario to make sure that they keep it. This is for sure they would do that. Uh, I have no doubt that they would do that. The question is, can this be done without constitutional amendment? And their chances of getting it as an amendment are, are, are virtually nil. But it does show you that they want to have a, a situation where they can pack the Supreme Court and where they can appoint members of Congress, not elect yeah. them. Again, yeah. is it? It is emblematic of the march away from constitutional democracy and a republic. Yeah, they're I trying to it. Marco, I wouldn't mind seeing a mass casualty event of about 100 to 150 Democrats voted out of uh, office in their seats. That's right. That would be, that would be a mass casualty. Well, uh, well uh, if I may, Marco, I mean, let, let, let me get this straight. I, you know, I my mind's slow, but to defend democracy... We have to suspend elections and speedily put people that are loyal to the party yes. in power in, 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 the, in the Congress. Nothing says democracy like appointing who we want and bypassing the people. Yeah. Well, they're doing that already with, uh, uh, you know, with the Democratic uh, nominee. Yeah, Nobody yeah, voted. Sure. Sure. The lowest. Sure. Of the it lowest. works for the president. Why wouldn't it work for them? Mm, it's uh, it, it's one thing that most, even most Democrats don't even realize is the fact that it, they were just, I don't even say bamboozled, that would be an improvement, but a, a bamboozled, at least you tried, that they just slipped it in. Nobody even nobody even said anything. Not Super one book for her. Not one. One, yeah. So anyway, it begs the question, you know, this maneuver, desperate attempt to con contain or continue the regime uh, but they also know, in my opinion, that there is inevitable backlash coming, and I think they're gearing up for perhaps that they they're not going to make it into this uh, electoral cycle, and uh, there's a full scale confrontation with the people that are really really angry with what's going on. Uh, now, there's no doubt that they eat their own. Jacob brought up the Eric Adams thing. I think that's a, that's an interesting one because for a while, and we played the videos here on our on our meetings, Eric Adams since. Early this year, even late last year, had been speaking out that New York City has been flooded. You know, let's not forget that he said it was a sanctuary city. He wanted this, but yep. eventually it became so bad that he says the federal government is flooding us and we can't hold New York City together. We have to, you know, draw a line in the sand. And now what we find out, they got corruption charges going back 20 years. Uh, you know, his election, Turkey, the government of Turkey, off from hotels, off from airlines. You know, my original thought was like, well, doesn't everybody do that? But they're going after him. Jacob, start with, let's start with you. Trump said if he keeps talking about the border, they're going to get him out. And a year ago, he said it. Boy, he was right. And now Eric Adams is indicted with federal corruption charges on the probe. Uh, many, many of his uh, um, people under him like, are, are basically out. A uh, flood of resignations, uh, basically investigation to some of the, the police chief, nonstop investigation that are coming. So you, you will start there. That's your native New York. We'll give you a first shot. Look, I have no admiration for Eric Adams. He never should have been elected. 
I don't like him politically. I think he has a racist streak in him. I just don't like him. On the other hand, what Donald Trump said is true and what Mr. Adams said is true. These charges are politically motivated. That's not to say they may not have some substance, but they're politically motivated. Much the same as what Letitia James and Fannie Willis well, and yeah. <laughs> X Smith and, and, and so forth. And, and of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the Mad Moose of New yeah, York. Smith. Yeah, I said him. And uh, the prosecutor in New York, the uh, New York City, the DA in New York City, rather. Um, oh, um, Fat Albert. I mean, what's his name? I'm sorry. Yeah, I forget, uh, what I mean. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I forget his name. I, don't know. I just know him as Fat Albert, but I forget his name. Yeah. yeah. These people are driving politically motivated prosecutions as a political weapon. Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg. But they will not simply do it against Republicans. They will do it not just against Trump. They will do it against other Democrats who go against them. It is weaponization of the judiciary. Now, notice what the Democrats have, uh, are doing. They accuse the Republicans, and I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent, but they accuse the Republicans and they accuse Trump. And I, again, I'm not happy with Mr. Trump over the abortion issue. But they are accusing their opponents politically of the very things they are doing themselves, making <laughs> war against democracy, suppressing free speech, politically weaponizing the judiciary with bogus prosecutions. Um, the court in New York today, a judge, the judge, New York Supreme Court, is now looking at throwing out that $457 million fine as, as, as bogus and unfounded over Donald Trump when he organized the develop, property development loans from Deutsche Bank. They said, this is bogus, this is nonsense. Um, again, but it's politically driven. Well, again, they'll do it against the Republican, against Trump, against the Democrat. They'll do it against anybody who gets in their way. It is not about preserving democracy. It is they who are the arch enemies of democracy. It's about preserving power. But who was on back of them? We know who's on back of them. BlackRock, Mr. S. Vanguard. Yeah. Vanguard, <laughs> interest of Silicon Valley and Seattle. We know who was on back of them. The left is no longer the party that challenges the establishment. The left is the party that is funded by the establishment. It's funded by the rich. The old left were anti-aristocracy. They were anti-robber baron. Now the robber barons and the aristoc corporate aristocracy and the financial community fund the left. The left itself is the stooge of the feudal lords of the new economy. This helps us understand why the Democrats always hold together so well. You yes. go outside, you color outside the lines, they're going to deal with you. Yeah, they do. You, you remember when Schumer said that about Trump, right, regarding the agencies, the intelligence agencies? They have six ways from Sunday to get you. To get you. Boy, is that true? And we watched a little bit of the video of that uh, FBI whistleblower. He's not the only one, but there's been several. He's the latest one, Mr. Marcus Allen. Uh, David Lister wanted to ask you what your thoughts were on, on, the, on the little excerpt that we uh, that we heard, because he's talking about, get ready, the FBI is not changing. Arm yourself, Second Amendment stuff, have food, get ready, get to know your neighbors, because what's coming, it's not good. And he's, he's a Catholic, so he says, you know, pray to the rosary and all that stuff. But he said, if you're a person of faith, you know, like I am, he's a, you need to pray. Um, what I, I mean, do you take his um, his words uh, in any sort of uh, warning? Uh, is he high part uh, high part verbalic in his uh, in his statements, or what do you think? Well, see, it wasn't just him that was saying this. No, he's not. There's the only several one. other FBI yeah. agents have come out because it's so bad. The culture is so bad. The FBI is a power unto themselves. They they. Under the Freedom of Information Act, we're allowed to 
sue them to get this information, but they can classify it and bury it so deep you'll never see it for 10 years, and then it doesn't right. make any difference. And so they're capable of doing this. They're capable of stalling on so many different levels that there is no justice. Justice delayed is no justice. And so they've, they're they a power under themselves. And so if Mr. Trump comes in, he needs to house clean, State Department, the FBI, the CIA, all these things. But if you remember, it was John F. Kennedy said that I'm going to destroy the CIA and bust it into so many pieces, it'll just be blown as ashes mm -hmm. to the wind. And the next thing, it was his head being blown to ashes, you know, so. Yes, it's and, not only that, they, they classified the sections of the Warren Report. They don't want the public to see for 50 years or something. And then when the date to release it to the public came, they still kept it classified. Yeah. They even said, uh, there's even people who have said that they've seen the originals of Peter Frell. That was quite different from the manipulated one. If you look at the manipulated one, you got a tree growing up halfway along the wall. It's not even down in the ground. So on the manipulated one that's made public. So uh, it's just, it's, it's amazing what they can do and how they control people. But this is the love of money and people are falling in. Well, the world needs Mr. Trump for fixing this because he seems to be the only one that may can fix it. You know, I know he's got his problems, but I always pray for him that, uh, yes. Lord, he did bless Israel. He did move the things. I reminded the Lord all the good things. I just also remind the Lord that he needs help with those things that he's compromised on and that I pray that he would be born again so that he could really be protected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need to pray because prayer makes a difference. And we got yeah. less than 45 days, six weeks, and uh, we got to find out, you know, we'll find out exactly what happens. Although I may not know, may not know on that day who wins yeah. or not, and who knows what's going to happen. But the uh, nonetheless, God puts kings, God takes them down, God puts them up. And it was interesting about Mr. Allen. Um, David, we'll go back to you. He said, and this is looking at his uh, transcript here, the reason why he was punished was because he questioned why there were so many informants on in Washington, D.C. on a particular day in January. And he said he started looking into it, and then all of a sudden they came against him because he uncovered what we all suspected. And then yeah. what we all know now is that Trump did want that place secure. Everybody wanted, you know, he said, go home, be at peace, be a good be a patriot, be a good uh, yeah. uh, citizen. And he ordered it. They didn't listen. They made the whole thing a mess. Now they're prosecuting people. There's still yeah. about 500 people in prison. But isn't that interesting? That's what he, he yeah. was uh, investigating. And it's come out that he did order Mr. Milley, General Milley, to have guards there. And now we see Nancy Sinatra, Nancy uh, Pelosi. Pelosi. I don't know why I call her Sinatra, <laughs> but anyway, she is a character. But she anyway, she took responsibility for not calling the men out. But we now see there were FBI informants that were out there calling people to come in and pushing yeah. them forward that were in touch with her on that day. There were multiple phone calls. So... There was something at play here, and it's all been washed clean, and hands are washed, and things are buried, and this is what America is in for. So, but he's also talking about something that might even fit in with this mass casualty event of the Congress being wiped out. Is uh, he wants people to have three months worth of food? Yeah, he wants people to have water to be have some ammunition, to have guns, to be able to protect yourself. Because if there's a mass casualty event of what he's talking about, you're then talking about chaos that can happen. Uh, you know, like we had chaos in Typhoon or Hurricane Karen, which uh, the city of New Orleans was evacuated and robberies started, you know, mass uh, 
uprisings of gangs. And now we've uh, we also have all these gangs, not just from Venezuela, but from many other countries and military age men. So they might be turned on to cause yeah. more havoc in America. Right. That's right, which is a potential situation that's uh, we're already seeing a bit of a shadow of that. Jacob, uh, you and I talked about what's going on in Chicago, and that is an absolute disaster. It has been a disaster with the with the gangs against each other, black gangs, Hispanic gangs, uh, yes. that were citizens. Uh, but now you have another element. You have Venezuelan gangs fighting against black gangs, and that is just detonated into a war zone. I mean, Chicago was bad. It is even worse, and no, yet you can't arrest any of them under sanctuary city law. That's correct. Orchestrated chaos. It was reported today in the news that the numbers of convicted sex criminals alone who are in the country illegally reach into the tens of thousands. Biden and Harris have let tens of thousands yeah. Tens of thousands of sex criminals in, to be in the country illegally. Rome, our cities, our streets, our neighborhoods. And yet there are people who are still stupid enough to vote for Harris. Chicago is a liberal city. Traditionally, rural Illinois voted conservative. That's why Everett Dirksen... Um, kept getting reelected in the in the Senate, but those days are long gone. Those days are long gone. The people of Chicago have suffered poetic justice. They have reaped the consequences of their own stupidity. They have voted Democrat repeatedly, and now they are paying for what they voted. I am crippled when I see those. There was a memorial that one mother made of all the children shot on the way to school in Chicago. Oh, I found it just crippling. Yet people in the black community in Chicago will still vote for people like Johnson and Lori oh, Light. They'll vote yeah. for the people whose policies are responsible for this. You can't save people from their own suicidal mentality. Willful blindness. That's right. Their willful blindness. They're easily manipulated, they're lied to, they're, everything is racialized, and they believe it, and they vote for their own death and the death of their children. But what can you do about it? This is the nature of the Democratic Party, and Illinois is one of the worst in the country. Mm -hmm. any, any, any state that would repeatedly re-elect somebody like Dick Durbin, a horrible <laughs> man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or the governor, Pritzker, the governor. Oh, oh Pritzker, yeah. Terrible people. Horrible people. But you can't save people from themselves. If they're determined to kill themselves and get their children killed, what can you do about it? I know. And the fact, Jacob, we don't hear any of this. Uh, it's censored. Quite a bit of censored. I mean, the only way, it, it was the only reason why people even knew about it was uh, independent journalists. Now Fox had a little bit of the, the, the guts to actually talk about it in a, in a, in a minor way. Uh, but it might get even worse because if uh, Mr. Georgie Porgy gets his way, he's going to have access to 200 radio stations to censor a lot of the news that we would otherwise get through radio. Jacob, you want to talk about that, that he's trying to get an exception from uh, the Biden administration? Why should he get an exception for over 200 radio stations to consolidate that much power? It is not the news, simply the way the news is reported in a biased manner. It'll be the talk show commentary. It'll be this talk show commentary that's affected. Uh, one of the few places where mainstream media has not had the kind of control it's had on, on the networks and on mainstream cable is on radio. Radio has been more diversified. Now they want to get control of that. This goes hand in hand with the general war on free speech um, that enunciated by none other than, than, than Harris. Harris yes. said that the First Amendment does not protect <laughs> does not protect what she called um, what did she what did she call it hate speech or no not hate speech you think um, she well, called misinformation. it misinformation misinformation yeah. yeah but misinformation means something information we don't agree with. Yeah. <laughs>
What so an evil, evil woman. And what stupid, stupid people will vote for her. But they vote for their own death. And they may just hand all these stations to Mr. Georgia Porter. Yes, well, they would. Them. Biden would try to do it. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 I mean, that is a, it, it's like a megaton shift within radio. I mean, to have 200 stations under the control uh, of that family. More oh. than 200. Yeah. And if, 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 the one he's already got, already has. Right, right, exactly. So it, it is going he's an old man, but his son is as notorious as he is. Oh, yeah, Mr. Alex is quite a character, if you say the least. I mean, he, he says it himself. My dad wasn't as radical as he needed to be. I mean, what, destroying England wasn't uh, radical enough? Trying to destroy the, 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 the pound wasn't, was it, uh, uh, you know, wasn't radical enough? Destroying Jews wasn't radical enough by back in the, uh, in the days of, uh, of Hitler and his father? So I don't know. I don't know what he has in mind, but he you know he has a proclivity for, uh, let's say, perversion and, and sexuality and things like that. And, and he likes a lot of white powder. So uh, I don't know. I mean, he's... These, he's, are, the, these are the allegations. I don't yeah. know... How much of it is true or not true? But those are the allegations. Yes. He, is he married Jade to uh, Uma Hamadine, or is it a? Yep. Is it a yes. Is yes. marriage. Oh, marriage, marriage to uh, Hillary Clinton's she was former. Married to, she was formerly <laughs> married to Weenie the Perv. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. She married. She was married to Carlos Danger when she worked with Hillary Clinton. She was married oh. to Carlos Danger. Oh man, that guy. I must say, she sure can pick him. She, she, she sure sang. I, I usually could, you could see something coming, like trajectories. This one I did not see at all. It was like what? You know, well, Alex Uma. I was, I was surprised. Go back in time, uh, back when Hillary Clinton was running, and one of her main campaign pushes was for the fairness doctrine. Now, yes, every single one of those two hundred stations that are up for sale to Georgie. Uh, those were the ones that rallied against the idea of the fairness doctrine. Oh, all, all down the line, they said no. And no. now, now the fairness doctrine is being brought in through purchase. Yeah. Well, you get the to the you same do. goal just yeah. through economic economic reasons this time, and rather than legislation. But they all have the same plan, and it all leads to the same destination. Yeah, Big Brother yeah. owns media. Yeah, yeah. If you if you think it's bad now, wait until this uh, this monumental shift happens. Uh, Jacob, another monumental shift that's happening is the UN. Uh, it's called the Summit for the Future. Yes, Summit for the Future. This is a it, it basically an essential step. They say, uh, you know, Gutierrez says an, an essential step to gear the UN to the 2030 and to the 2045 goals that they have. And it would be a long time to explain it all, but pretty much this way, it is a plan to bring the world under the control more and more of the UN, more CRT, more um, you know, LGBTQ stuff, climate change, anti-Israel policies, you know, all those things that they've been doing. In a more well, radical way. Organization to use pandemics engineered pandemics for political control purposes. Under emergency powers, right? So they say that they have been very effective, but not as effective, you know, because some countries are not really going for it. But the summit of the future is to deal with international challenges. Now, the UN came about in 1948 to replace the League of Nations, 1948. It's the same year that Israel became a nation. And ever since then, it's been a, it's been a, yeah, it's been a formidable uh, they say formidable enemy to Israel. Uh, they won't go after it. I mean, they've been known for giving prices and 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 and, and uh, awards to uh, let's say nations that don't care about human rights, but they actually give them uh, awards for being humanitarian. They won't go against any of these dictators, but they will go after democracies. So they believe that they need to access the future. They said, you know, crises are too much. We need to change. Few countries stood against it, Jacob. 143 nations voted for it. Just a few did not like it. And, and some of them were, uh, you know, I believe would hear Argentina not going for it since yeah. it been known to be politically left and Marxists and communists and socialists. Uh, El Salvador was destroyed uh, by the policies of dictators and terrible civil war. Now there are the few countries who are saying, this is going to destroy the world. You're going after Israel. You're going after people that want freedom. 
and you're claiming you have freedom? Now, this is going to be a destructive force. You get most of the nations, most of the nations of the world are voting for it. Jacob, your thought on the UN future, uh, the sustainable future? Well, first of all, obviously, it's in harmony or it's congruous with what Zechariah chapter 12 says, what Revelation 13 says. Mm-hmm. We understand that the, the political direction of, of, of the UN is very much in harmony with biblical prophecy that what will precede the return of Christ, including in Zechariah 12, the nations coming against Israel. You just think of it. You have the United Nations High Commission for Refugees based in Geneva, a massive organization. Why is there a second separate United Nations Commission for Refugees, so called, just <laughs> for Palestinian Arab Muslims, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency? Why mm. is there two? Why, of all the rest, they get a separate one? Now, you got between six and seven hundred thousand Muslims killed in Syria. The UN says nothing. There's a bloodbath going on right now, much worse than Gaza, happening in Darfur. As usual, yes. the United Nations says nothing. What happened in Yemen? Four hundred thousand killed. United United nothing said nothing. Everything is about Israel. Okay, for for defending itself from radical Islamic terror. Okay, why is there in addition? to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees, which is a bureaucratic, oh, it's, it, it, it's reputation for misallocation and misappropriation is incredible. I think sometimes it does more harm than it does good in the way it wastes money. That's the Geneva crowd. But why is there a separate one that we now have proven, proven, documented and video evidence collaborates with Hamas Islamic terror, funded by the UN, funded by the Biden administration, funded by the British government, funded by EU countries. Why? Why do we have two when the second one is actively involved partnering in Islamic terror? One of the things you see about the second one, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency, is this. It perpetuates refugee identity. It's not about refugees. It becomes about the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. Muslim countries do not want to absorb so-called Palestinian Arab Muslim refugees the way the Israelis absorbed Jewish refugees from Iraq, from Iran, from Morocco, from Algeria, from Tunisia, from Egypt. They, the Israelis absorbed the Jewish refugees from the Muslim world with the collapse of the British and French Empire. They absorbed them. Muslim countries do not want to absorb the Palestinians. The United Nations Relief and Work Agency redefines, in the case of the Palestinians, it redefines a refugee, not as a refugee, but as the descendant of a refugee. Spain's the waves. It is absurd. It is absurd. But what is even more absurd is for American taxpayers or British taxpayers to fund it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is a anti, definitely anti-Israel. David Lister, I wanted to ask you this. They gave an award for peace and disarmament to Iran. They gave an award to Saudi Arabia for women's rights. They gave an award to China for human rights, the CCP. Um I mean, they don't have a track record for any, anything good. I can't think of any good that the UN has done except for getting the way, lift up dictators, destroy the democracies, bring all these radical ideas into the world, and, and literally in bondage to, uh, to these nations that obviously, and they will come against you if you, if you cross them. Yeah, and... When I saw Yasser Arafat get the Nobel Peace Prize, I knew all these prizes were rigged and that there is no peace that's an absence of of conflict in this world. These prizes are given by these group of countries which are Muslim, authoritative, communists, and dictators that rule the U.N. America needs to get out of it. So all they're doing is patting each other on the back and 
giving out gold and prizes for the leadership to have better lifestyles and to create a political narrative to destroy Israel. Yeah, it, it is definitely, and, and that, you know, I wanted to ask you this too, that, that they're very spiritual, which is the bizarre thing. You think this is all political and, and war and, and try to defend nations, and yet they have what they call Earth Day, in which they say we have to pray to the spirit of the earth. They have Yoga Day, which they have to, uh, you know, accept Hinduism. They, they all sing this song once a year. It's called uh, Imagine by John Lennon. They all hold hands and, and sing this song, right? And you, if you know the lyrics, look it up, right? Uh, bizarre. It, it, it's, it, it is a spiritual organization, in my opinion, with bizarre you know, political affiliations. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well... Madam Blavatsky's books are in the UN's library. She's the ultimate place of who to worship, which is Satan. And all this comes back to this one world that is all under one world ruler. And you can approach this God by many roads. Yeah. Oh, I and, forgot to mention, they do have a UN God. I forgot to mention, you can go into their prayer rooms in yeah. New York and pray. And you can imagine whatever God you want into this, this 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 stone that they have. And you can look into that stone and imagine your own God. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all whatever God you want or even can imagine. It's a legit as long as it's not the God of Christian, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus Christ. Yep. Jacob, one thing that UN has not done, it stopped any war. Any war whatsoever. In fact, they've they've actually empowered nations to get more more radical into the wars. And right now, um, another you know wonderful organization, NATO, is mobilizing resources to get ninety thousand troops from thirty European nations or ally nations, as you say, and stepping to defense with Germany, committing a hundred billion dollars to go after Russia because things are getting really 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 bad in Russia with Ukraine attacking into the Russian territory. You have Russia, uh, of course, Putin is saying that we're changing the nuclear doctrine. We're going to change it against the West. So this is coming to a head at some point. We've been tracking this for over two years and uh, over three years now. So what is the next step, in your opinion, with these two forces coming at each other? Plus, don't forget, Iran is very much in the news. We'll get to Israel and Russia supports Iran quite, quite, uh, quite a bit. And so that's well, another North issue. North Korea and Iran are in bed together yeah. and to a degree China. But let's look at this in, 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 in stages or in multiple aspects. This week, Russian armed nuclear bombers appeared off the coast of Britain. Russian nuclear armed naval vessels appeared off the coast of Great Britain. He mm. said, this is not good. This is this is Cuban Missile Crisis type stuff. Yes. This is something you don't, do not want. It is happening. Now, I've always said Putin is a bad character. I've always said, and I've been to Russia, the mafia was running everything, the oligarchs were running everything, and, and Putin was running everything. He's a neo-Stalinist. He was driven by anger at having lost the Cold War. He has stated that. That is the greatest disaster that ever happened in the 20th century was the collapse of of the Soviet Union. I don't like him. I don't trust him. He's an aggressor. He's a bad man. Nonetheless, this war never should have happened. It I agree. would not have happened. It would not have happened if we had a strong president. Barack Obama and his demonstrable spineless weakness that he showed in Syria is responsible for giving Putin the green light to go into Crimea in 2014. He did it because he knew he had a spineless loser in the White House and the person of Barack Obama, given Obama's placation of Iran and what happened in Syria when he drew a line, in, a red line over chemical weapons and the line was crossed and he did nothing. He knew Obama was all tech and no, no backbone. So he went into Crimea. He sees what Biden did with Harris in, in Afghanistan, the same thing, it gave him a green light. He's absolutely a bad man. But had you had a strong president 
had, had, had Trump been in the White House, it would not have happened. And a lot of other things would not have happened, including Gaza, including um, Chinese aggression against the Philippines, including North Korea, again, shooting missiles over the Sea of Japan. These things would not have happened. There was peace. And the peace went away because of the Democratic Party. We have to remember, in a fallen world, peace can only come through strength. It never comes through weakness. And with Biden, Obama, Harris, you have weakness, and our enemies know its weakness. The result will always be war. Second aspect, today, Donald Trump met with Zelensky and publicly stated that you're not going to defeat Russia. It is futile. It is a stalemate that we drag on and on and on. You need to negotiate something that will offer Putin something to pull out. Watch. We will not bring the Ukraine into NATO would be a good point of commencement. We will keep the Ukraine out of NATO. you got to give him something. But what you see happening with what NATO is doing, they are taking away the incentive for Putin to negotiate. And I don't like him. I don't like him. But the only reasonable, only sane way out of this is to negotiate, not to say Barato. Now you look, these same cowards will not stand up to Iran, but they are standing up to Putin. Now there is something else happening here. Nobody is talking about it except certain people in international banking and in the intelligence community. This is what's happening. They don't want the BRICS. They don't want the dollar threatened as the world base of the world currency reserves. Okay? They must do something to bring about a destruction of Russia economically and to hurt China to the degree they can. Okay? That is why you see Biden has enacted even certain actions proposed by Trump against China. The BRICS is a factor that's not being t- talked about. This is one of the reasons they are wanting to push Russia into a corner. Russia has gold reserves, it has oil, it has natural gas. They want to economically undermine Russia, not just politically undermine it. They want to politically undermine it in order to economically diminish its power and its leverage. Russia can only have that kind of leverage when it had the capacity to market its energy resources. Now that is gone. The Baltic Sea pipelines, the oil and natural gas they were selling to East and to Western Europe and to Germany, Europe has gotten on without it because they began buying natural gas from the United States, liquid gas and things of this nature, and also from Qatar and, uh, and certain other sources. The West mobilized to reduce the reliance upon Russian exports of of oil and natural gas. There is an economic factor on back of this. It's not about Russia alone. It is about BRICS in part. They want to keep the dollar. The United States has this advantage. You can write checks and don't have to cash them. You lose that. You're not going to be what you were. Hmm. Very, very true. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, I did want to ask a question regarding the CCP. Uh, David, we'll go to you. They've been aggressive. They've been aggressive in the Pacific, uh, shooting ICBMs into the Pacific. I think, Jay, was that you and I talking about how they flew over Japan? And yes. Do anything about it? Yes. They've been very aggressive over Japan, over Taiwan. Uh, they are perhaps making their move, knowing that there's about 45 days or so since uh, to have the election, and a strong Trump may not be good for them to get over Taiwan. But your thoughts on the aggressiveness of the CCP? You want me or Jay? Uh, David. Okay. Well, Japan has put a military vessel through the Straits of uh, Taiwan there. 
so which China thought was very provocative. So we're seeing all sorts of moves by China that are warlike. Um, and also, they're trying to get their people pumped up on money. They just pumped nearly $900 billion into their stock markets, which is going to get people focused on building the economy back again. And so that's sort of like a wag the dog move if they if they're planning to go into Taiwan and take this uh and take Taiwan because they do need uh, they do need these chips to continue their dominance in the future, which is gonna be artificial intelligence, because there is boycotts on some of the uh these chips from American companies. So they've got to do something, and if they know if Trump comes in, things are going to be really tough on them. They're they're having trouble. They don't have jobs for the youth. They don't have uh, a lot of uh, even. Uh, they've been buying food from Brazil. Brazil has problems with drought this year, so they're struggling with that, and they're having some real economic problems. And they've got to do something to maintain power. And if they can do it through war, quickly take Taiwan, not too much damage, well, now they have uh, what they need is chips at a reunification of China, which would show Xi as a strong man. As a strong leader. Yeah. And of course, I think the iron is hot with the Biden and Harris administration. Of course, yeah. I think they're leading. So it's why it's weak because Trump won't allow it. They know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was reading. Uh, I, I didn't know that many bases. The U.S. has actually closed down so many bases during the Biden administration. It, yeah. it is, they, they recently just shut one in uh, shut down one in Iraq under the New Deal. Uh, Jacob, before we get into the Middle East, I wanted to ask you this. The weakness, it is absolutely clear. It is. Oh, it yeah, is the naval warships that they don't have the staff. Yeah. To man. Hey, you're shutting, of ammunition. You're shutting down bases in the middle of a Middle East war. Ready? PEI is driving down re-enlistment and enlistment in the military. Yeah, it, it, it is an acknowledgement, of course. Yeah. But again, there's so many stupid people that will vote for them anyway. They'll vote for that babbling bimbo anyway, without realizing the ramifications of their stupidity. And, and and only that too, Jacob. The fact that our U.S. troops have been really severely hurt in Iraq. I mean, we have U.S. troops being constantly shot at, constantly um, attacked, and there's no response. It's almost like there is absolutely like it's not happening, and we'd rather withdraw in yeah. the middle of a problem. Harris lied about that during the debate. She said oh. there are. She lied. ABC, being liars, did not fact check her. Yeah, and now she wants to go to CNN and do another debate. Uh, well, we hit the hour mark. I wanted to welcome everyone who's been uh, who's been watching and who will watch later on Catching Up. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of Catching Up. We've got a few more subjects to go. We will be going on backstage in a few minutes, so hold on to that. we got a lot of questions coming in, Jacob, so we're coming in hot. So uh, we've been ready to go uh, for backstage. So good stuff. And we appreciate your questions and your comments. Uh, Jacob, Israel among the nations, 356 days since October 7th, when 1200 Jews and about 200, uh, 200 Jews, 1200 Jews were, were, were killed, including women, children, 200 Jews were taken hostage. They have not been uh, brought back to their homeland. They've been killed Americans as well. Heavy bombing in Hezbollah, uh, against Hezbollah targets this week in Beirut. The war has been going on almost a year. It has now moved from the Gaza area, which Hamas is still in, uh, has an enclave there, to the north. And they moved a lot of equipment. Israel moved a lot of equipment to the north. They've been attacking from the north. Uh, Hezbollah has been shooting into Nazareth, uh, Kiryat Shimona, places like that. Over 96,000 Israelis have been displaced from the northern Galilee. Children can't go to school. People can't go to work. It is now the time in which Israel believes it needs to grow in there and 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 ground incursion perhaps to take all the Hezbollah members out. And uh, we, we've seen that through the pages. We've seen that through uh, specific attacks. Yet the world is against Israel again, despite of trying to destroy a terrorist organization sponsored by Iran. The world 
seems to be on the side of terrorism. Jacob, your thoughts on what's going on up in Beirut? It doesn't look good for Lebanon. And is there a stupid woman accuses Israel of terror because it targeted the Hamas leadership. And she accuses them of terror. Israel didn't attack Hamas or Lebanon. They attacked Israel. But October Israel started shooting rockets on October yeah, but then Israel was accused of terror for targeting the leadership. Well, something has happened today that is should have happened years ago, in my estimation. The Israelis tried to take out Nasrallah today. I don't know if they did. I hope to God that they did. But they finally bombed his headquarters, which is underneath a residential area. They were reluctant to do it in the past because they used civilian residential apartment blocks as human shields, much the same as Hamas does. That is part of the radical Islamic strategy. You, you target Israeli civilians and use your own as human shields, securing the knowledge that the BBC and MSNBC are going to blame you when the Israelis shoot back. Um, well, today they attacked the command bunker, which is a big facility. Uh, underneath four four major apartment block th- blocks in in um, Beirut, we don't I'll know. Be happy to know he's been eliminated. Oh, he has he just been. confirmed it. Yeah. Well, thank God for that. Now he's in hell with his prophet Muhammad, and he knows Allah is not God and that Jesus is Lord. Thank God they killed him. I'm glad they took him out of the game. He's a wicked, he was a wicked, evil man. Thank God he's gone. It's going to be interesting now to see what happens. How will Iran react? What will they do? My guess is it'll be more rhetoric. I don't think it's going to be something that it's going to cause Iran to attack Israel. I really don't. Um, I think it's going to put shockwaves into, into Lebanon and into Hezbollah. But what happened today, killing Nasrallah, has had a major, major, it will have a major impact on, on, on his Hezbollah's future. I'm not saying he won't be replaced. The Iranians will get someone to replace him. But I'm saying that it will not be the same again. It will be like when Trump took out Soleimani. Um, you can give somebody the job. Somebody can succeed him, but not replace him that easily. You know what I'm saying? They'll get a successor, but not a replacement that easily. Um, so this is a step forward. Thank the God of Israel that he's been removed. Um, and I, I I don't want to see anybody go to hell, but w- w- where else is he going to go? Um, this is good. This has been a good day. Now, what is interesting is the Israeli airstrike was timed, timed precisely, that when Benjamin Netanyahu finished addressing the United Nations, as soon as he finished, they dropped the bombs within minutes. Within minutes of Benjamin Netanyahu concluding his speech at the General Assembly in Manhattan, I used to live right across the street from it, the Israelis took out Nasrallah. Netanyahu said, we have a right to defend ourselves from Hezbollah, we will do so. And he finished his speech, and a matter of minutes later, Nasrallah was killed. Quite a day. Quite a day. Very significant. But the world's going to blame Israel. Did they confirm it, David Lister? Did they confirm it? Yeah, I just went on to uh, X. Okay. And uh, uh, I I follow a couple people there that are uh, very informed with Jews. One is called Vivid. Yeah, Um, yeah. He's... I think the official report is, look, they believe he's dead. They They don't believe believe he's dead come out alive, they have confirmed that he was in the bunker, right. but um, they don't actually believe they'll even be able to recover the body, but it's not 100% verified that gotcha. he's dead, but they believe so. Yeah, we're looking at the, yeah, we're looking at the IDF account and, and exactly that. It was just that they believe that he was there. He probably won't be able to survive that, but they can't confirm it as of yet, but the probability is pretty high. Uh, Jacob, I wanted to ask you this. The, the fact that his bottle is just about done makes the West even the opportunists here. They immediately jump in. Macron, Biden, they demand a 21-day ceasefire right now. 
uh, Khomeini is actually convening a meeting of Security Council as we speak, and they're and Biden is delaying some of these uh, uh, weapons to Israel. They're not going to give them any more bombs, tractors, or helicopters, or at least they're going to slow them down into Israel. So as soon as you have Hezbollah to the point where the brink of extinction, give it to the West, give it to the Americans and the French to come into the rescue. And just like Reagan and Baker in 82, uh, when we had, uh, the, the, well, not we, IDF had uh, the PLO surrounded in Beirut, the tanks going into Beirut, um, the Arafat was done. They called them back. The IDF retreated. Uh, Lebanon's never been the sense ever since. So it just seems like another thing is going to happen. Your thoughts on that? 21 day ceasefire immediately. This is Ronald, right. Reagan, Ronald Reagan did Islamic terror a tremendous favor when it armed Iran and the way it mishandled <laughs> Lebanon, even when 251 Marines were killed yeah. on the Reagan administration. And it was not Reagan, it was. He was, it was George Bush Sr., it was um, Baker, it was Weinberger. Reagan was like Biden. He was just doing what he was told. But well, he yeah, said he was the president. Yeah, he was the president at the time. Yeah. Um, I, well, I talk about that in my first book, um, The Fight of Words of Satan, and what really happened in Beirut. I was, I was in Haifa, Israel, in Galilee when they would not evacuate injured Marines to Israel. They wow. sent them to Cyprus, Germany, and everywhere else instead. Uh, yeah. They were arriving DOA. Anyway, sure. Reagan was not what people think he was. Um, be that as it may, uh, what, what you see happening is BB, knowing it's the American election, was able to politically get away with ignoring Biden and Harris. And remember, Biden is, is senile. Harris is a cackling bimbo, a word salad. She, she serves word salad. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You're talking the real, it's Barack Obama's people, maybe Susan Rice, certainly Jake Sullivan, Blinken, Austin, but it's not Obama and Harris. They are simply the front men, much the same as Reagan was the front man for Bush, for Baker for Weinberger, for the executives of the Bechtel construction conglomerate who, who, who were controlling the Pentagon and the State Department at the time, so too Biden and Harris are simply front men, showpieces for the real powers on back of them. Um, but Biden said that, and Macron said that, but because it's an election pending in 45 days, Bibi Netanyahu knows he can get away with ignoring Biden and going ahead and doing what needs to be done anyway. <clears throat> Jacob, don't they have to have this peace now because they're so devastated? I mean, so they call up their uh, air <laughs> boys yeah. and ask them to put this out? Yeah. They're, I mean, they know they're in trouble in both, in both Gaza and in Lebanon. They know they're in trouble. Yeah, they know they're in trouble, and what they do when they're in trouble is call for a ceasefire, reorganize, rearm, regroup, so they can do it again. And the policies of the American government, and that was Reagan too, was yeah. to give them the opportunity to reorganize, regroup, yeah. to carry on the jihad another day. That's what Reagan did. That is what Obama did. That is what Biden does. Yeah. That's what Harris will do. Yeah. yeah, that's why Ariel, Ariel Sharon had the PLO surrounded in a Beirut back against the wall, ready to wipe them out. Yep. And the American government said, no, don't work, wipe him out. And Ariel Sharon said, then we will have this problem for 50 years. Do you know it's been 50 years since? Then? Just about. No. You Just know about. what? You know what else happened? It was the Bush administration yep. that forced Israel out of Gaza without a peace Yep. 2004, 2005. This is the fault of Bush. Uh, of, of Bush, Bush Reagan Republicans. That's correct. Well, um, I got to give a Obama credit because he mocked <laughs> Romney when uh, Romney said Russia's our main enemy. He said, oh, no, they aren't. Remember on the debate? Yeah. 2012. Yep. 2012. 
So, David, I wanted to ask you this. They condemn Israel about this because of the killing of civilians and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, if you look at it carefully, right, Hezbollah, with their charter, with Iran, their whole existence is to really create another Islamic republic within Lebanon and to destroy yeah. Israel. How can you ever make peace with an organization that exists for the sole purposes of destroying you and destabilizing other countries like Lebanon? I mean, they go to Syria and they kill people there, Hezbollah. They go to Iran and they rape and kill people in Iran at the behest of the Iranians. So this whole thing, it's a red herring. Of course, Israel's not uh, you know, in, in involved in what they're saying. They're targeting uh, Hezbollah fighters, they're targeting Hezbollah leaders. But your thoughts on this, David? Israel has always tried to limit civilian, uh, civilian um, deaths. We even saw when the SEAL team was sent in to kill Osama bin Laden. He put his wife in front of him. The guy was a good target. He hit him right above the eyes. He was a tall guy. But nowadays we've seen with this new onslaught of, of Lebanon, Israel has the capability of looking inside people's houses and we're seeing missiles. We're seeing rocket launchers. We're seeing everything having been placed in all these homes. And so people, the, the people are made pawns. And when they die, oh, now you're a martyr because you died in the war. So there are, Hezbollah is so evil, they don't allow people and their own people to exist in peace and to be able to say, no, I don't want a rocket launcher here. No, I don't want missiles in my house. No, I don't want all these weapons stored here. And so this is on Hezbollah. This is not on Israel. But Israel goes so far as to warn them, hey, we're coming. We're going to blow the building up. Get out. I've seen films where Israel called every person in the uh, building and said, we're going to blow it up. And then next thing you know, you're seeing Hamas there with guns saying you can't leave the building. That's correct. And, you know, and I, I seen a wonderful film, Oscar worthy, of a young man had his uh, sitting on a building, the building collapsed. He had his baby boy there crying over him. It was Oscar. It was Oscar performing till the kid reached up and scratched his uh, foot, you know, so and moved. But they do this. They have a makeup facility where they they make people up if they're dead because the films they show the guy's dead over here. Two days later, he's dead over there. Same actors, same people. You know, it's yeah. It's, well, the way they lied about them. the hospital getting hit by a missile that was their own missile landed in a parking lot next to it, and they said yeah. it was that, you know, it's, and they all they out and out lied. But continuous yeah. with what David said, if you today, the speech given by the Iranian president to the UN, president of Iran, he came to New York, they had to let him in, and he gave the speech at the UN, and he said Israel's been unable to defeat Hamas in Gaza. Well, you're holding hostages, and unlike Hamas, Israeli cares about civilian casualties. They don't want to kill their own hostages or get them killed, and they don't want to kill any Palestinian, Arab women and children if they don't have to with collateral damage. So because Israel does not have the subhuman barbarism of Hamas and Iran, they say Israel is unable to, to defeat Hamas in Gaza after a year. But they could do it in six hours if they didn't care about human life. The, but of course, he said that for the consumption of the Muslim world. Not for yeah. anybody with the brain. Fifteen nations, yeah. Yeah. Jacob, what about this this notion that Hezbollah is doing this attacking Israel, killing Jews on behalf of the Palestinian people because they have suffered so much yeah. against the Israeli occupation? I mean, could you could you elaborate a little bit on that? Okay, let's look at what happened in Gaza before 1967. When Israel was forced in self-defense to invade Gaza in 1967 and captured it. Israel tried to give it back to the Egyptians with Camp David. The Egyptians wouldn't take it. 
Sadat didn't want it. Under the Israelis, the stand, according to the World Health Organization of the United Nations, no friends of Israel, the standard of living of Gaza Arabs increased 370%. Infant mortality, longevity, employment, everything, nutrition. They were beneficiaries of the Israeli conquest to the tune of a 370% increase economically and in terms of longevity, health, infant mortality, everything. But they were kept in squalor by Gamal Abdul Nasser, by the Nasser government of Egypt. They were kept in squalor and used as political footballs by the regime of Nasser, who was basically in the pocket of the Soviet Union at the time. Um, it's just lie upon lie upon lie. Their standard of living went up under the Israelis. Uh, now that it's gone down again, that is because of the Palestinian Authority who looted the money, and then Hamas who got power from the Palestinian Authority, but it's easier to blame Israel. This idea of the suffering is ridiculous. As far as Palestinians in Lebanon, in, most of them have not come from Israel. Most of them came from Jordan in Black September. The Jordanian government of King Hussein drove them out of Jordan because they were loyal to Yasser Arafat in Black September. The Jordanian legion, trained and armed by the British, killed 15 to 18,000 of Arafat's gunmen, massacred them, and drove tens of thousands into Lebanon. Yet the lie is told that these are Palestinian refugees in Lebanon Yet they're Palestinian refugees from Jordan. Most of them are not from Israel. Lie upon lie. But you tell the lie often enough, people will think it's the truth. And yeah, it's also a tenet. Go ahead, David. Go ahead, David. It's also a tenet of Islam. It's called acceptable lying in war warfare. Yes. Yes. You're, you're allowed to do it. All warfare is waged by deception. And so the truth is so precious, you, it must be barred guarded by a bodyguard of lies. So if you lie and for warfare and for furthering Islam, it's acceptable. And yeah. so that's... It's the so doctrine of al -tal -tal permissible lying. Permissible yeah. lying, that's right. So, so Hezbollah is not acting on the behalf of the Palestinians. I mean, anybody that believes no. that just has to look at the fact of why Hezbollah was created and what they do to other Arabs in Syria and in Iran, of course, the Persians. Uh, it's, I wonder if it's, that, it's, the, it's the battle of Kabbalah. It's the Shiites against the Sunnis. Oh, the Karma. Oh, yeah. Kar Kar yeah, that's, that's who they're always fighting. So you have to look at it from there. Of course, you know, of course. Hamas or Sunni, Hezbollah or, I'm sorry, Hezbollah or, or yeah, and Hamas or Sunni. Yeah. yeah. I wanted uh, just just to finish up the Israel part. Uh, I don't know if you guys. Uh, I, I played a video for you guys earlier. Was the uh, in, in Tel Aviv, and, and it was it was really interesting. And, and uh, news caps news did not capture this, but it was really interesting how it was a big party in Tel Aviv, and uh, people were dancing, and it just seemed like like a Western debauchery type stuff going on. And uh, soon after that, there was an alarm of the Houthi rocket shot toward yeah. Tel Aviv. Uh, people hid. People were very concerned, and they captured it on film. People were concerned. Then they came out uh, of hiding because it, it seemingly the danger was uh, was past. And, and Jacob, they began to sing. People began to sing this song. It's very popular in Israel. It's called "Children of Believers." And these secular liberal Jews yes. beginning to sing. We're believers, children of believers. We have no one else to rely by our heavenly Father. My heart to you in prayer, my heart to you, oh God, you are king, please save us. I'm not saying they became Christians and believers in, in Yeshua overnight. But no. what I'm saying is the terror and the problems that, they, that they've been having, is God using it to bring the children of Israel back to the faith of their fathers? Absolutely true. The ultimate climax of this is going to be when they look upon him, they have pierced. But the Lord is using this calamity they face to draw them back who was saving faith in their Messiah, Yeshua. Absolutely true. Something else that happened in Israel this past week, some police got in trouble for beating Hasidic Jews with batons, 
when the Hasidi Jews were protesting, not legally protesting, but trying to close down job fairs, and they were angry about cons- threats to conscript them into the military. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, the hypocrisy of, of, of the ultra-Orthodox is unbelievable. You'll see. Well, there are individuals in the ultra-Orthodox community who have gotten saved, and I've known some. I've known some. Not many, but some. Most of the Israelis who get saved are what's known as Masoratim. They're not quite secular Jews. They believe in God. They believe in the God of the Torah, and they believe in the importance of the Torah for their heritage and identity, but they're not religious. They're not religious. They'll only go to synagogue on high holidays or special occasions or something of that nature. Um, These are the people who are most likely to get saved, particularly young ones, particularly yeah. young ones. And those are the kinds of people you saw singing. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe it, Jacob, because even after they began to sing a cappella, even they, they couldn't go back to partying and dancing anymore. They just kept singing this song. And, and I'm not saying at, at all, I'm not saying that they were calling on Yeshua or any of that. But what I am saying is that they began to see, that, look at the lyrics, we have no one else to rely on but our Heavenly Father. Yeah. It was you interesting. Know, I was last week, I was in Auschwitz scouting locations for the documentary. Um, and uh, James got copies of it. But there was a, a, a rather large group of Israeli teenagers who were visiting uh, Auschwitz during all this trouble. And I spoke to them in Hebrew, but I, I, I yelled out like, I wasn't yelling, but I was I was talking very loudly so they could all hear me. And I was saying those kind of things. Am Israel high in Mizrat Hashem and Dr. Kabet. With the help of God, we shall overcome. And and these are all secular Israeli teenagers. And they all were fighting. You know The Jew knows. The Jew, most of them, I'm telling you, the Jew knows. The Jew knows. They don't understand, but they still somehow know. Partially blind, right? That the God of their fathers is the true God. Right. Yeah. yeah, this is a spiritual battle going on in Israel. You know, it's the God of the nations, uh, the, the God of the evil nations, of course, talking about the, the, the devil using yep. Allah and uh, in the God of Israel and whose God is the greater God. And we're seeing that uh, that that spiritual nature, um, you know, in the battles that are going on. So uh, much to pray for the Jewish people, much, much, much prayer for the Jews, much, much prayer for the Arab people, the children of Abraham uh, as well from Ishmael, that they need to come to the faith in the, uh, in the Lord Jesus and uh, for the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as well. Let's finish this off with uh, some of the church issues that we, we uh, wanted to address. Uh, Jacob, we'll start with you. And, and this is, we, we talked about it last week, uh, but it's it's taken another spin. This is what happened to Steve Lawson. Trinity Bible Church uh, was taken down uh, from his position. He stepped down, was taken down by the elders because of a sexual sin uh, with a woman for quite a long time, over five years, quite a bit younger than him, quite a bit younger than him. I think she was in her 20s. And um, the, he, he had confessed. He basically stepped down. What happened after that is what really troubles me. Um, more than that, uh, obviously, there's a horrible thing that happened with the, with the adultery and the women involved in, in his sin. Uh, 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 there's some some reports that people caught him. Uh, the, the father of the girl caught him and, and told Lawson to stop seeing this girl, to stop seeing his daughter, which is a horrible thing. But quite a bit older than than her, uh, he was like a, a shepherd to her. He, he was like a, an adult, like a father figure to her. And he took advantage of that. He took advantage of a relationship that um, he was seen as the, the mature believer, like a father-like figure, looked up to him as a spiritual father. Uh, Jacob, you've seen cases like this. This is a horrible thing that happens where yeah. women are manipulated into, uh, I remember like Errol Polk, I think he had that yeah. type of relationship with these several women that yeah. looked up to him like a like a godly yeah. man. He, he violated them. And, and what a horrible thing of fornication that's going on. So um, this, um, 
So I, I don't know. Was there any fornication involved? It was an adulterous affair, yeah, in nature. Um, yeah, no, there was no literal fornication involved, but their tie to one, one another was adulterous in spirit, if not in fact. That's how it was um, That's how it Both of them denied yeah. there was any, Okay, you know. Like, like, it's better than, than, than not, but at the same time, it's terrible. Yeah. Jacob, this this preying upon women by these leaders, this, this, this spiritual leaders, not the first time that happened, but here you go again. Well, what's interesting is you'd expect it from a Mike Bickle or from a uh, Paul what's his name from oh, Hillsong, yeah, in, in New York, Hillsong, or from Brian, oh, yeah, Carl Lentz, yeah, or, or Jim Baker and Jessica Hahn. You'd expect it from hyper charismatic extremists. You'd expect this kind of immorality from such people. I've, ex I, you know, we had it with Bill Hybels. Uh, you know, you'd expect it with, with, with certain kinds of people. But he is from the MacArthur camp. You know, the, 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 he is somebody in the Todd Friel, Bill Johnson, John MacArthur school of Calvinistic thought. Um, and it, it shows that these kinds of sins are across the board. They don't only affect continuationists or charismatics or Pentecostals. They're across the board, and it went on for some years, apparently. Now, okay, if there was no actual sexual copulation, that makes it less serious, but it was still wrong and inappropriate. Um, absolutely. Uh, we all have to be careful. We all have to be careful. I've never had an affair since I've been married, but I'd be a liar to say I haven't had opportunities and I haven't had temptations. I've been tempted, and I've had opportunities. The Lord has always kept me from it. But believe me, I can see how easily it can happen. Another thing that evolved from this, Jacob, this is more on the theological side. Some Calvinists, not all of them, I'm not saying every single one jumped to his defense, but some Calvinists came out and they said, well, this doesn't affect the doctrine of grace and God's sovereignty. This is about church discipline for, for, for loss. And God raised up loss, and they said, and caused his fall for his glory and his own good. This and is if God caused his fall and that God exposed what happened to him, that could be the case. That could be the case. But if they mean if God caused him to sin, that is the exact kind of Calvinistic thought that motivated Jacob Arminius to challenge Calvinism, against which the Calvinists responded with the tulip, the remonstrance of Dort, that makes God the author of sin and evil. What you have here is what I've always said. That kind of Calvinism is simply Islam in Christian masquerade. It is inja Allah. Everything that happens is God's perfect will. Well, it was not per God's perfect will that somebody should sin. So, yeah, you do have that kind of Calvinist. You've always had them. Um, and you have them now. Yeah, it, it, David, listen, we'll go to you. It's confusing. God raised up Lawson for him to sin so he could be restored? What I mean, it, it really? I mean, I thought God doesn't tempt anybody. Well, I thought He told taught us to pray, "Lead me not into temptation." Yep. Yeah, Jim so, says God leads nobody to uh, to temptation. Nobody to sin. There's no sin or darkness in Him, and it's but it's just a perversion of it's just a perversion of uh, of 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 God as being able to do this to men. So you know, it's it's. It, it's people should listen to Jacob's uh, uh, teaching on Reformed theology. I forgot the name, what you call it, J Jacob. Um, but anyway, what the Re Reformation forgot. That's one of yeah. that. What the, re what the Reformers forgot. Yeah, what the Reformers forgot. And, and just how anybody can reach a state of their Christianity to justify sin that it was God that caused it. Now, the devil, I always thought, was like the guy involved in temptation. You know, keep me from evil, okay? Keep me from the evil. Well, the evil one, yeah. Yeah, so well, this he obviously fell into sin. Yeah. 
because he was tempted, or maybe the appreciation of a 20-year-old girl and him being older and everything gave him life or something, and he fell, okay? But now God can restore. Yeah, I mean, God can the, forgive. Yeah, repentance. He can do all those things that his nature says, but there is no darkness in him, and God doesn't cause men to sin. Well, would I blame God for my own sin? You, this, this is how no. disgraceful determinism is, which is really what they're talking about. Yeah. Determinism is is basically this is how they excuse their sin. This is how evil men excuse their sin. I'm not saying law says excusing it like that. I'm saying the people that are defending this are saying, well, God raised them up to sin so God can restore them. Uh, this is how these people excuse their sin, basically saying God intended for him to sin, and that's it. That God intended for me, so I'm restored. I, I give God the glory. So man doesn't have free will now, right? Well, that's the exact determinism, right? That's the determinism it's all about. So... Uh, the Bible's very really clear. Sin is on you. It's on you, dude. It's on One you. That it says, so, uh, resist the devil and he will free, flee. Absolutely. One but passage the full that they God, right? One passage that they try to apply to justify that kind of thinking is when Samson went off with Delilah against the wishes of his parents when he went off with the pagan woman. Yeah. Was immoral. And it said God intended it for good. You know what I'm saying? That 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 yeah. in, the, in the saga of Samson, where God intended it for good. Um, God allowed it for the greater good, but that does not mean that God wanted him to. to God can bring good out of evil. God can bring good out of evil. But to say that he he was right to go out and have this relationship immorally with this pagan woman. Uh, and that was God's will, is a complete distortion of the text. But that is the that is the hex they will usually resort to to try to defend it. Yeah. And, and I promise you, this doesn't do good to anybody. It doesn't no, it do doesn't. good to Steve. It doesn't, it doesn't do good to it any believer. It, it doesn't good to anybody. Uh, but God causes people to sin. How about the world? I was about to say, the world, the world is the one that's missing out the most. The world looks at yeah. this and says... What's the difference between Christians and, and us? Yeah. We're, they're exactly the same. They have the same uh, dalliances that the world has. Um, I'm reminded of, of a Genesis where God is warning Cain, saying, Satan is crouching at the door. Its desire yeah. is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, last subject. Uh, oh, <laughs> can I make one quick thing? Make last quick, week we, we, had, we yeah, real quick. Last wow. week we had Flip Wilson theology that God made that the devil made me do it. Now this week we've got these people saying God made us sin. Yeah. Well, we always need They're somebody both in to blame. the same camp. We need somebody to blame from our early fathers, you know, yeah, right. Adam and Eve. Until now, we need somebody to Thank blame. You. In my own means, I'm not saying Steve is saying that. Please do not yeah. misunderstand. I'm not saying Steve is saying that. And I'm not saying these all these pastors coming out, but there is quite a number of Calvinists who, and, and to the point is logical conclusion is that if you believe in determinism, then God is the cause of all things, including right. this. If, if that's yep. your line of thinking, right? It's that's, consistent. That, that's fine, but call it what it is: Islam. Don't call it Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the last one. It, it is the Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa uh, split. Uh. Jade, we've had good friends. You have good friends within Calvary Chapel. You spoke in the Calvary Chapel circuits, you, in the conference circuits. You have good friends, uh, godly people. You've attended at Calvary Chapel, so did I, for a very long time. Uh, this week, or this past week, uh, Vanessa, which is a granddaughter, the oldest granddaughter of Pastor Chuck Smith and Kay Smith, uh, came out and addressed the question that a lot of people have been having since the last uh, 15 so years. There's been a split in Calvary Chapel, this uh, the, the global network and what they call CCA, Calvary Chapel Association. And she addressed the question, why did it happen? And she very much, in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, in, in a very godly way, my opinion, and very succinct and very properly addressed the fact that it was Brian Broderson who brought across progressive ideologies, progressive thinking of Christianity, 
uh, leftist ideologies into the church, progressive thinking into the church. And um, it caused a split. And then they gave a whole line of reasoning of even when Chuck was still alive, there was a split. And and he brought other thinkings, other theologies that Chuck was not in agreement with, even bringing in pastors to speak at different conferences. So it was coming on for a long time. Eventually, uh, Pastor Chuck passed away, went to be with the Lord, and then began the process of splitting the global network would went with Brian, and he said he wasn't comfortable with Genesis to Revelation anymore, as it was traditional within the Calvary Chapel to teach but, uh, book by book, verse by verse. Now that Brian's been on there for a while as head of Calvary Chapel uh, Global Network in Costa Mesa, his son is taking over pretty soon, uh, Charlo. And, um, and the issue of Israel came up. The issue of Israel came up. And uh, they do not believe that the current state of Israel has anything to do with biblical prophecies, which really took back a lot of people that have been following Calvary Chapel for a long time, because that was one of the the staples of Calvary Chapel was to recognize God's prophetic purposes and plan for Israel in prophecy. So, uh, Jacob, we'll start there. You have talked about this. Uh, not only you, did you warn before it happened, you talked to other believers about it, pastors. You had Paul. Paul Smith was a good friend of ours. We spent some time with them. He admired your work. He admired your books. And uh, to see this all unravel, it's a pretty sad thing, but it just put it into words for us. I knew 25 years ago that Brian Rodison was not a Christian supporter of Israel, and he did not interpret the scriptures the way Chuck Smith did or the way most Calvary or other Calvary Chapel pastors did. 25 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, I, John Higgins, Chuck's brother, Paul, David Hawking, among others, we all warned what would happen if Brian Broderson ever got control of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. I was not the only one. Maybe I was the most outspoken about it, but I was not the only one. 20 years ago, we said this was going to happen. And Israel is only one of the issues that are problematic about him. He has compromised with things that Chuck never would have approved of, including the purpose-driven agenda and various other things. Brian Broderson was a beachcomber. He's not a very good expositor of the word, in my opinion. He, one of the weaknesses of Chuck was nepotism. <clears throat> Chuck had a weakness for nepotism. That is the reason Brian got in the, any position at all. It never should have happened. I saw this coming. I'm telling you, I speak only for myself. David Hawking saw this coming. Um, Paul Smith saw this coming. You saw it coming, Marco. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you just saw it coming. But I'm only speaking for myself. We all saw this coming. It should not be any big news to any of us. I got in a lot of trouble, as you pointed out. Yeah. Put out a video, stated it publicly. Perhaps you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, I remember we, we, we did the video. And, and, and Jacob, you remember, we did the video at the behest of some Calvary Chapel pastors. Yes. Came to you and said, Jacob, you can speak on this. You're you're not, you know, a Calvary Chapel pastor. You know quite a bit of what's going on. You're friends with Chuck. You're friends with Paul. And can you address these issues? Because we're yes. all concerned. You did it gracefully and you did it graciously. You paid a heavy price for it. Because people came against you uh, in a way that I, I've never seen. You know, disinviting you, did not want to fellowship with you, counseling you. And yet all you did was exactly what Bradley, Vanessa here, uh, has done. Uh, as as part of the family, and obviously she has uh, more stake in it because she's a family member. Uh, but obviously she's not a pastor; she's not a leader of, of, of the church. But but you did it in such a way that you described many things that happened down the line. That you knew Brian was a big John Stott guy. You know he he loved John Stott, and he brought John Stott annihilationism and replacementism within Calvary. He talked about it. You warned about it. It happened. I'm not saying it's like would take credit for it because it was not good what happened. Uh, but it is a video that I would suggest people to watch. This was done a long time ago. Jacob addressed it. David, you remember, uh, I believe you were there. We shot it uh, uh, at the church. And uh, and these issues have come home to roost because it could have been stopped. It could have been addressed. It could have stopped the split, perhaps, 
had they addressed it. But many of the uh, known coverage type of pastors, and some of them I know, uh, their friends, um, you know, were heartbroken about what was going on. They came to Jacob about it. We addressed it. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think many behooved the uh, the warnings of what was going on. And like Jacob says, he wasn't the only one. He was just speaking about it. But Paul was speaking about it. Roger Oakland was speaking about it. Uh, David Hawking was speaking about Absolutely. it. Roger Oakland tried to stop it, and they crucified him. Yeah, yeah, they did. David, listen, your thoughts on that? I mean, because you were uh, you were right in the midst of it. You saw it happening. You saw the disintegration of it. We don't take any joy and any pleasure. Uh, good friends, good good family that yeah, goes to Calvary Chapel and loves the Lord. And it's it's heartbreaking to see uh, godly churches that are now being influenced by progressive ideologies and replacementism. Yeah, I I saw something because once for a long time I was a youth pastor in a assemblies of God. And I saw them going off. Mm. Okay. So I saw from the top down just disintegrate. And I saw the same thing was getting ready to happen here. And then like Jacob, me, you, we all had these guys telling us inside information. You know, all the way to the top, you know, brother to brother stuff from Paul and oh, yeah. you know, and the concerns and and the, even in the some of the women telling us these things. And I really believe that Paul wanted Jacob to say something because he, he knew him. he wouldn't compromise and he would tell the truth. That's right. And, and he was viscerated by Lots of Calvary Chapel. He became people that we shared stage with, excommunicated, basically shunned him for telling the truth. And now God has proved Jacob out. That's right. And these other men should hold their head in shame and ask for forgiveness for what they did. They should have stood alongside Jacob and the truth because they knew it. They yeah. knew what was going on. They knew it better than us. They knew it better than us at the yeah. time. Yeah. I know guys like taught in Philadelphia. They knew what it was. I was at his church. I know what he said. Nerd. You know, they tried to save it. Yeah. There was yeah. no saving it. And now his daughter, is, being a righteous woman, has, has probably thrown the last shovel of dirt on the grave. Yeah, the courage, the courage to do it. No, no doubt about it. And and of course now you know the global network uh, is struggling with the idea of gay celibate theology that that never yeah. would have existed at the time. But now it's it, they don't promote it. I'm not saying they promote it left and right, but they have certainly adopted it as part of certain ministries that work alongside Calvary Chapel to say. Yeah, this is this is progressive thinking, progressive ideologies that are coming in. Uh, but you know, to to take away. From Calvary Chapel in this regard, but they're not the only one. Southern Baptist uh, denomination. Yeah. What yeah. Russell Moore has done, uh, Jacob Russell Moore. I, I mean, he was once a. I mean, he was highly sought out to be a speaker. He was a dean of the of, of the Bible College or the seminary. Um, he was even on one extreme. He was a, a extreme conservative on one end. You know, uh, you know, didn't want to allow any drinking. You know, of alcohol or anything like that. He was he pretty much a, a conservative fundamentalist orthodox. You would put it that way. He swung completely the other way. Yes. Now he's leftist, progressive, CRT, open borders. Uh, you name it. New York Times, uh, Christianity Today. He is even accosting conservative Christians. Um, he was influenced by Tim Keller, a major proponent of this, J.D. Greer with his DEI policies and LGBTQ and having racial quotas, Andy Stanley with the accommodation of LGBTQ. Uh, Jacob, any comments on the Southern Baptists, uh, what's happened to them? Because just like the Calvary movement, here's the Southern Baptist who's also suffered tremendous things. When the Southern Baptist Presbytery did not stand up in unison, and oust J.D. Greer. Mm. It was time to sign the death warrant. Mm. Once you compromise with what J.D. Greer had been saying about homosexuality, it was inevitable that other people would come along who would be not just as bad, but worse. We live in an age of apostasy. 
Yep. It appears that that, that Russell Moore is a, someone who's apostatized. Mm-hmm. He's a person who once upheld truth and now is turned against it. He's what Jesus warned would happen. There'd be a great apostasy, and he is an example of it. But it it's more than just him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, David Lister, uh, Tim Keller, seminal influence to all this. N.T. Wright, seminal influence on this. Then you see the results. Russell Moore, J.D. Greer, Andy Stanley. Policies that never would have existed even when, when you were a youth pastor. These things would have been shunned by major denominations that are now, if you don't agree with it, you are the outcast. Yes. Yeah. You know, for most of my life, I was raised in Southern Baptist. Mm, I didn't know that. Knew, you know, my mother was Southern Baptist, and I was raised in, anywhere we moved around the world. She would find a Southern Baptist church, and then <laughs> she Lord. would interview the pastors. Praise to, God to make sure that they knew the gospel and that they would teach it, and and that they would pray for my father. So right. she always got us in church, and <laughs> so I, I mean, I've seen the Southern Baptist ball. I I used to visit Adrian Rogers church now and then when I lived in Memphis. I thought he was a good preacher, but then one day I saw that he had to make a ruling on Masonic lodges that a um, Southern Baptist could be a Mason and a Southern Baptist. I think there was that was a a mistake on his part that let that infection in there and uh and everywhere after them, they started bringing in false teachers. That's what you oh. do. You bring in one bad guy, another bad guy, and pretty soon destructive doctrines are introduced. And what does it destroy? It has destroyed the Assemblies of God. It has destroyed the Southern Baptists. They, Jesus called it destructive doctrines. Dr. Harrison, that's right. And um, what a shame. It makes it gives us no pleasure to, to talk about this. No. Uh, but uh, Jacob, what kind of, uh, I'll leave it with this. Jacob, what kind of warnings can we take from this? What happened to Calvary? What happened to the Southern Baptist? Because if we think that that cannot happen to us, we already swallow the lie. But what can we learn from it to understand as a Christian and as part of maybe Moriel, as part of other churches that watch this, uh, watch this episode? It's part of church history. It's the same pattern. The Methodists were begun by John Wesley, George Whitfield, godly men, Charles, Charles Wesley. What is it now? It's, it, it, it's something that is hell-bound. It's, it, 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 it's a spiritual sore, most of it, most of Methodism in the, in the UK, and, 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 and a substantial amount of it in America. Now, you do still have some Wesleyan Methodists who are, who are godly, but mainstream Methodism, certainly in Britain where it came from, is, is, is morally compromised and doctrinally bankrupt. That's true of the Presbyterians, the United Reformed Church, and it's certainly true of the Church of England. Um, it gets worse by the day. Well, it's, it's just the same pattern. What's happening to the Southern Baptists and Calvary Chapel, what's happened to the Assemblies of God and the Yielding Movement, it's just the same pattern. It's just the same pattern. Everything begins good. They get away from the faith of their fathers. They get away from the biblical teachings of Scripture, and they wind up in the same situation. The only difference now is the momentum and the scale at which it's happening, because we're in the apostasy of the last days or at the close of the age. That it's is certainly the last hour, isn't it, Jacob? It's certainly getting there. Yeah, I don't want anybody to think that this is inevitable. It should not happen, and and it didn't have to happen, and it doesn't have to happen to Morial, to CCOD, to ministries and churches that hold to the Word of God. But the great warning lesson is, if it could happen to them, it can certainly happen to us if we take our eyes off of yep. Jesus. Just remember, get discipleship. The Assyrian captivity didn't have to happen. God warned them through Hosea and Amos and Elijah. It didn't have to happen. The Babylonian captivity did not have to happen to Judah. If they listened to Isaiah and Jeremiah when there, when there was time, it wouldn't have happened. None of these things ever have to happen. But the history of Israel is written for our instruction, according to 1 Corinthians 10 
and yeah. Romans 15. And if we don't learn from the mistakes of Israel, we're going to repeat the same tra tragic rebellion against God and his word that they did and reap the same kinds of consequences. This has gone back to the Old Testament in Israel, and it's true about the ages of the church, and it's true now, only it's happening on a bigger and bigger scale. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, if not by the grace of God, we would go the same way. So hold on to Christ, hold on to Jesus, make disciples, continue to pray, fast, get into God's word, get into Bible study groups that can help you get into the, if, if there's no Christian around you, uh, David Lister, any, 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 anything you can recommend to believers that they don't fall into the same trap? Get people that know the word of God around you. Also get people around you. Like Jacob said, I don't want yes men around me. And that's what many pastors do is they put yes men around you. And so make sure you have people that will tell you the truth. And then also make sure that if you that you keep studying, you keep reading the word of God and and you hear it coming out of your life, not only out of the work of your hand, but out of your heart and keep witnessing to people and keep doing what we're told to do. Keep doing the work. and. Get good friends around you that love the Lord. You, it's not easy today. It is not easy. But you have to do it. You have to desire that wonderful person-to-person -person fellowship. You know, I remember when my church went off, I had to drive 43 miles one way to go to church. Okay, and, you know, and, and that's what you had to do. You know, I had to drive it, but I always remember I had a heated car, an air conditioned car. But I remember that lady in Kenya coming down the road that walked like almost two hours each way every Sunday to come to church with three kids. Great she God. wanted to be there. You've got to want to be in fellowship. You want to be with God's people and you want to be with him. You've got to keep that zeal, that that zeal that you love him. That's right. You know? Yeah, that's right. And to take away, as, as we finish, we're going to go over to the questions in a minute. Uh, to take something from Pastor Chuck, you should say all the time, just for Calvary Chapel, uh, Costa Mesa, you know, stay the course, he would say. Stay the course. One thing I would add, Marco, yeah, go ahead. we published a book called The Dilemma of Laodicea, and we've done different recorded teachings about the church of Sardis, one is the good church in a bad neighborhood. Yeah. If you look at the World Council of Churches, mainstream Protestantism is more heretical than the Roman Catholic Church that Protestantism set out to reform. In many respects, it's worse than what it set out to reform. Um, yeah. That is the state of Protestantism. And sadly, that includes much of professing evangelical Protestantism. Yeah, it was fallen by the wayside, for sure, for sure. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Davey. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to go over on backstage. Uh, one more thought that I had uh, uh, as we finish. Uh, Jake, if you recall, Paul Smith uh, read your book, Shadows of the Beast. Told yes. me about it. And even as a pre-trib believer, he said, you know, Jacob might be right. And Jacob, I never forgot that because we were sitting at a diner and he said he read the book, put it down, and he says, you know what? Jacob might be right. And I know he was getting into his elder years and he couldn't, he wasn't teaching a lot. He wasn't saying much, but we had him at our church. And uh, so it, it shows you that he was it's a very humble man, willing to admit that, hey, what you what the yeah. Lord showed you was in line with scripture. Yeah. And that's what he, he, was, he was older and, and age takes its toll on everyone eventually. But all the and, and shock both remain mentally astute till the end yeah. of their lives. Yeah. And he wrote yeah. that book. The New Evangelicalism, which I think every That's Christian good book. To, yes. got to. Jake, Marco, you remember with Paul, he he said, you know, I know Calvary Chapel made pre-trib a primary doctrine, but he said, I was always open 
to reading the Bible and being led by what it said. Yeah, let this, that's this when he came out with that statement. Yeah, absolutely. He let the Spirit teach you. And, and when he said, Jacob might be right, Jacob might be right. You know, so praise the Lord for that. He's in glory with the Lord now. And uh, um, he doesn't have to deal with all of this, right? <laughs> but we do. And so let's take the course, continue on preaching Jesus, making disciples, fasting and praying, outreaching, and, uh, and stay in the course. So God bless you guys. We'll see you in just a couple of minutes. I'm backstage. Hello, and thank you for watching Moriel TV. There are so many things that are happening at Moriel Ministries worldwide, from the Philippines to Japan, to India to Africa, and back to Europe and the United States. So many of our brothers and sisters are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to this lost world. We are so thankful for your prayers. God has been faithful and has blessed us in so many ways. If you'd like to partner with our efforts abroad and at home, please take a moment to click the link in the description and help us as the Lord leads you. Thank you very much and God bless.